Good afternoon. The first item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions on rural affairs and the environment. I would be grateful if questions and answers could be succinct. And I call Graeme Day to ask question number one. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to realise the potential of peat and restoration for emissions reduction purposes. Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, we are working with Scottish Natural Heritage to develop a peatland plan for Scotland. Supporting this, I announced on 22 of October funding of £1.7 million over three years for peatland restoration. And this commitment recognises the multiple benefits that peatland restoration and maintenance can provide. We provided funding for restoration in particular in the flow country of Caithness and Sutherland. I thank the Minister for his answer, but can I draw his attention to evidence given to the RACCE Committee back in April, which suggested that an average spend of £12 million a year over 10 years might be required to fully grasp this opportunity, a sum, however, which might be arrived at by drawing down funding from a variety of sources, such as CAP, Life Plus and Scottish Water, as well as the Scottish Government. Can I ask the Minister what work is being done to determine how sufficient monies can be amassed from varied sources such as these to ensure that we do fully restore Scotland's peatlands and maximise their contribution to combating climate change? Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, I am grateful to the member for the question. Um, the funding provided will be used to develop and implement a peatland plan and will be specific, specifically support physical restoration activity. I endorse the views of the committee that peatlands provide a number of benefits, as I outlined earlier, and as such, uh, peatland restoration projects are potentially supported by a number of funding streams. I can assure the member that, uh, as part of the development of a peatland plan, we will consider how such funding streams may be utilised, as well as the opportunities for drawing in private sector support. I am pleased to note the positive progress of the SNH RSPB um, uh, bid to the Heritage Lottery Fund, which has advanced through the first stage of further consideration. Briefly, please, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, can I ask the Minister what is being done to help educate the public and involve local communities and schools, such as my own previous school near Brayhead Moss, with the lowland raised peat bog conservation as they are a rare and threatened habitat, and managing them also helps flood prevention and many other issues like biodiversity as well as carbon storage? Minister. I certainly recognise the point that Claudia Beamish uh, uh, mentions because I've, I've met with Scottish Wildlife Trust and I know that's a key area that they're concerned about in terms of the raised bogs, particularly in lowland and central Scotland. And uh, I will be having a, f a, f a discussion with Mike Russell uh, very shortly on how we can incorporate biodiversity and environmental messages in the curriculum for excellence. And I will take forward that point that she raises. And also briefly, Jamie McGregor. Uh, does the government believe that farm support schemes should recognise and reflect the value and public good of peatlands on farms and crofts. Minister. I recognise the point that uh, Jamie McGregor makes. Um, certainly it's true to say that we're still evolving our understanding exactly what the impact of peatland can have in terms of uh, abatement of, of climate change and sequestration of carbon. And I will take on board the, the message he makes. Question number two, Sarah Boyack. To ask the Scottish Government on what date it will publish its National Marine Plan. Cabinet Secretary Richard Lockhead. As set out in the revised statement of public participation, it is expected that the National Marine Plan will be adopted towards the end of 2014. We will formally consult on a draft plan next summer. This timing allows for an integrated consultation with marine renewable sector sectoral plans and proposals for the marine protected areas. Sarah Boyack. Can I thank the Minister for that timetable? Minister, the fast-moving pace of development in the marine environment, such as renewables and aquaculture, was a key reason why the Parliament legislated for a marine plan in the Marine Act. Um, is there no scope for the plan being prioritised and brought forward so that it can provide certainty for industry and lead the development of these sectors rather than being led by them? Cabinet Secretary. Well, one of the reasons why we want to take a little bit more time before we consult on the draft National Marine Plan is because our discussions with stakeholders have highlighted they want everything to be looked at in the same context and together in that integrated way, so that when we look towards the decades ahead, given that the plan will influence what developments do take, Scotland's, take place in Scotland's waters uh, literally for the next few decades, uh, we have to get it right and we have to look at all these issues in the round. So uh, I'm confident that we will end up with a regime which balances all the interests that our waters require uh, and that the current developments that are going ahead meantime are taking into account environmental considerations and uh, other considerations. Question number three, Kevin Stewart. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to improve recycling rates. Richard Lockhead. Well, prior to the establishment of the Scottish Parliament, Scotland's recycling rate was under 5%. Today, our recycling rate exceeds 40%. And, of course, the Zero Waste Plan has set Scotland on the path to 70%. This year, Zero Waste Scotland is providing funding for 
rolling out household food waste collections. The Scottish Government has also made available a further £1.2 million to support improvements to household waste recycling centres and for improving other areas such as glass collections. Uh, these are just some of the highlights of a broad programme of support being provided to businesses and local authorities by Zero Waste Scotland. Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. Um, I wonder if the Cabinet uh, Secretary can expand on what is, being doing, what is being done to encourage cutting food waste and what is happening across the country to expand food waste collections. Cabinet Secretary. <coughs> Well, I'm sure if the member is able to grab the occasional spare moment he'll see on the television. There's a good advertising campaign taking place just now, encouraging people to cut down on their food waste, uh, given that one-fifth of our household food waste ends up in the bucket, uh, and that is a cost to uh, the budgets of homes across Scotland, and of course it's a cost to the environment as well. Uh, it's also worth saying that Zero Waste Scotland is making £5 million available to local authorities to help them roll out the, the household food waste collections I referred to in my answer. That will help ensure an additional 485,000 households will have their food waste collected by the end of the year, with more to follow over the next two years. Given that only a couple of years ago virtually no home anywhere in Scotland is part of a food waste collection scheme, I hope the Chamber will recognise that is uh, significant progress in taking what has been a, a bit of a scandal over many, many years in terms of the food we waste as a society, taking that challenge very seriously. Question number four, Patrick Harvey. Thank you. Can I ask the Government what its position is on the aims of Land Action Scotland? Minister Paul Wheelhouse. The Scottish Government supports community involvement in the local management and ownership of land, and Patrick Harvey will be aware the Scottish Government has established the Land Reform Review Group uh, with a view to understanding how land reform can support sustainable development. Patrick Harvey. Thank you. I, I was hoping for perhaps a, a slightly more ringing endorsement of this particular campaign's objectives. It, it aims to challenge landed power in Scotland and the concentrated pattern of land ownership and to democratise land and allow the people of Scotland to reclaim a stake in their own country. I hope that the Government strongly endorses the aims of that campaign uh, and I hope that the Minister can confirm that he will keep open the option of reviewing legislation if the campaign finds that these aims can't be achieved in the current context. Minister. Certainly, in, in response to, to Patrick Harvey's point, um, while the approach used by the Land Action Scotland to target specific charitable organisations may result in specific changes, uh, such as the Mount Stewart Trust uh, changing um, its Memorandum Articles Association to make it more demo uh, democratise the organisation, and there's other similar moves in, in Applecross, we certainly recognise the, 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 um, the issues there, but I, I would reiterate the point that the Scottish Government remains committed to the Land Reform Review Group, and we have charged that group with a radical uh, review of land reform issues, and trust that that will address the points that he raises. Briefly, please, Jean Urquhart. Thank you. To uh, ask the Scottish Government whether the Land Review Group plans to meet with Land Action Scotland in a similar format to its meetings with land is, la, the Scottish Land and Estates, Community Land Scotland, Development Trust Association Scotland and the Scottish Tenant Farmers Association. Minister. Uh, in response to Jean Urquhart's point, um, just to point out that the Land Reform Review Group is independent of, of government in terms of its uh, uh, choice of action, in terms of gathering evidence. Um, we're kept informed of what they are doing, but I would encourage her, if she wishes uh, Land Action Scotland to participate in that, to encourage them to write to the chair of the Land Reform Review Group and, and ask to meet with them. Question number five, Angus MacDonald. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it has taken to minimise the impact on agriculture of the Schmallenberg virus. Richard Lockhead. Schmallenberg virus is a relatively low impact disease spread by midges, although infection during particular stages of pregnancy can lead to problems around lambing or calving, at, uh, calving time. Helping producers to make informed management decisions is key to minimising, of course, the impact of the Schmallenberg virus. The Scottish Government has therefore funded enhanced surveillance and delivery of guidance to veterinary practices and has worked with the industry to facilitate the testing of animals imported from affected areas. Angus MacDonald. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. Um, while no acute cases have been recorded in Scotland, it is clear that those farmers who have recently imported livestock from high-risk SBV areas must be extra vigilant and ensure that introduced breeding stock are tested for the virus. I am aware that work is ongoing to produce a vaccine. Uh, does the Cabinet Secretary have any detail on progress regarding an SBV vaccine and whether there is an estimated timescale for its introduction? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I should for the record just point out that four premises 
in Scotland have been confirmed as having the virus so far. That compares to around 300 south of the border. So clearly it's an issue we have to pay uh, close attention to. In terms of finding a vaccine, which of course could potentially offer a solution for addressing this issue for livestock keepers, vaccines, uh, as the member may be aware, are usually developed by commercial enterprises. Then they have to go and seek a license in the UK government before making that commercially available. So, as things stand, it is right to say that no vaccine has yet been approved for use uh, on these islands. However, I do understand a submission has been made to the UK Government's Veterinary Medicines Directorate for a provisional licence uh, for a vaccine. Uh, of course, the uncertainties associated with uh, vaccine licences due to the rigorous nature of the testing that has to be required before they are put in the market means it is difficult at this point in time to say exactly what the timescale will be for making that available. But clearly, uh, the, we do hope that uh, one is developed in the near future. Alec Ferguson. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I am sure the Cabinet Secretary would agree with me uh, that rapid reporting in, in the case of any disease, and like Smollenberg, is very important in its control. Can I ask the uh, Cabinet Secretary where he has got to in consideration of the Canard Review, which of course recommended the closure of a number of Scotland's veterinary investigation centres? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as the Member may be aware, no decisions have yet been taken on the recommendations, and we are going to be looking at them in the months that, that lie ahead. Uh, cases such as the outbreak of Schmallenberg virus, which no doubt is the context of the member's question, highlight why our surveillance infrastructure in Scotland is so, so important. So we have to get these decisions right. Briefly, Ian Gray. Um, to ask the Cabinet Secretary if the Scottish Government has considered testing milk tankers for the virus rather than the more laborious method of testing individual farms so as to more efficiently identify potential sources. Minister. <coughs> I would highlight this is a midge-borne virus. However, I'm happy to speak to our scientists to uh, investigate the point made by Ian Gray and perhaps uh, drop him a note explaining the background to, to the suggestion he makes. Question number six, Malcolm Chisholm. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government when it will publish the second report on policies, proposals and policies. <coughs> Minister Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, this is a complex, wide-ranging project, and work is ongoing to ensure that the draft report is sufficiently robust to remain relevant for at least the next five years. Our intention is to lay the draft report on proposals and policies, or RPP2, in the Parliament by the end of 2012 and ensure there is adequate time for consultation. We will, of course, keep uh, Parliament up to date. Malcolm Chisholm. I uh, thank the Minister for that reply. Given that the first emissions target set under the Climate Change Act was missed, how will the revised RPP for 2010 to 22 ensure that Scotland does meet all future legally binding climate targets set by this Parliament? And does the Minister agree that an important part of that will be shifting as many proposals as possible into the realm of policies? Minister. Uh, certainly in terms of the point that Malcolm uh, Chisholm rightly makes, uh, it's essential, I think, for Scotland to try and convert as many proposals that were in the RPP into policies, and that's something obviously we'll be taking forward in terms of the, the uh, publication of RPP2, looking beyond the period 2022 to 2027, which is the main focus of that document, but we will obviously refresh progress in terms of uh, the analysis that's presented in relation to um, objectives set out in RPP. Um, certainly in terms of the, what the government's trying to do, we will we will certainly work very hard to ensure that um, we uh, can address uh, the uh, emissions targets we have, uh, we have set for this government, legally binding annual targets and obviously the overall targets, and we are clearly determined as a government to uh, meet those targets. Briefly, Angus MacDonald. Thank you. Um, can the Minister give me an assurance that given the importance of RPP2, the government will focus on getting it right and that Parliament will be given adequate time to consider the document? Minister. Uh, Angus MacDonald is absolutely right. We are conscious not only of the Rural Affairs Committee's view on this, but, but wide, widely in the Parliament that members are keen to ensure they have adequate time to uh, feed back on the draft RPP2 and to ensure that it is a robust document that has, uh, given, given that there is considerable global attention on this document, I think it is important that it is robust and absolutely correct. And also briefly, Patrick Harvey. Thank you. Committees in this Parliament are currently completing their budget scrutiny. How are any of us to have the faintest clue whether the government's climate change policies are adequately funded when we don't know what those policies will be changed to to make up the lost ground from the missed target? Minister. 
I, I recognise the point that Patrick Harry makes, the, the concern that he has raised previously on a number of occasions, and indeed when we, we met recently, about the, the tie in to the, to the budget. Um, what we are trying to do is to ensure, as I said to, in response to Angus Macdonald and to, to Malcolm Chisholm, ensure this document is robust. Uh, but we have also presented information, as was promised by the Government, to committees on the detail of current spending on uh, measures that impact on, on our, our climate change targets. And I hope that will inform discussion of, uh, by, by subject committees and by the Finance Committee of the Government's proposals. Question number seven, Colin Keir. To ask the Scottish Government what progress is being made on improving air quality in cities. Uh, Minister Paul Wheelhouse. Thank you. The Scottish Government is working closely with local authorities, SEPA and other partners to improve air quality in cities. We support a number of uh, measures, both local and national, to successfully tackle air pollution. These include the establishment of a statutory framework and clear strategic aims for both air quality and transport, providing grant funding for local authority actions and providing advice and information through the Scottish Air Quality website and Scotland's Environment Web. Colin Key. Thank you. Uh, Kings Ferry Road at Barnton, St John's Road, Christophan, in my constituency, have some of the highest levels of air pollution in the city of Edinburgh. Can I ask what action the Scottish Government is taking to ensure local authorities comply with carbon monoxide targets to mitigate the health effects of air pollution? Paul Wheelhouse. Um, as a former resident of the area that Colin Keir refers to, um, I re recognise the issue he raises in addressing local air quality issues as a matter for individual local authorities. The Scottish Government provides technical support and some funding to monitor and, where appropriate, support particular actions. Uh, we maintain a regular contact with the City of Edinburgh Council and other local authorities to provide help and advice in undertaking their statutory air quality responsibilities. A briefly supplementary, Claire Baker. Thank you. Considering that the failure to meet um, the EU air quality directive targets can result in fines, what consequences does the Scottish Government believe they face if we continue to miss these targets? Paul I agree with Claire Baker that it is obviously um, very important that we meet our, our targets in terms of air quality directive. The Scottish Government, in partnership with Transport Scotland, SEPA, local authorities, UK Government and others, is working on a range of measures to ensure full compliance as soon as possible. And these measures are set out in detail in the UK's application to the Commission for a time extension to give us time to adapt to this. Question number eight, Stuart Maxwell. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I ask the Scottish Government what the take-up rate of grants for improving the quality of private drinking water supplies has been in the last three years? Paul Wheelhouse. A total of 995, or 5 per cent of Scotland's registered 19,886 private water supplies have been improved over the last three years, receiving grants totalling £5,121,590. Stuart Maxwell. Uh, can I thank the Minister for that answer? Uh, given the relative, relatively lo lo low rate of take-up, can I ask the Minister what uh, policies and practices he is pursuing uh, in terms of advertising the existence of the grant, uh, ensuring that we see an improvement of a take-up for this particularly important area in public health? Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, the member raises a very important point, and local authorities administer the private water supplies grant system on behalf of Scottish ministers. Many local authorities are already active, very active in the promotion of the grant system, and examples of this include information on individual local authority websites, letters and leaflets to owners and users of private water supplies when samples taken from supplies fail standards. Some local authorities have advertised the grant system at, um, at farming events and journals aimed at landlords and radio interviews and even on the, on the side of council vans. But additionally, the grant scheme is promoted on the Scottish Government website and Drinking Water Quality Regulators website and in its annual report. Question number nine, Dave Thompson. The Scottish Government, what progress it has made on implementing the provisions of the Crofting Reform Scotland Act 2010? Minister. Uh, excellent progress has been made towards the implementation of the provisions of the Crofting Reform Scotland Act 2010. The Crofting Commission has been established with a firm focus on becoming an effective regulator. It has become more democratic, and as the member is no doubt aware, I recently appointed Susan Walker as the Commission's convener. In addition, secondary legislation is almost complete, with instruments relating to the implementation of the Crofting, Re Crofting Register recently laid before the Scottish Parliament. Dave Thompson. I thank the Minister for that reply. The requirement for reports on how crofts are being used, uh, which is not an unreasonable one, has caused some concern among crofters who are not sure exactly what is required. Can the Minister tell us what guidance has been or will be provided to grazing clerks and common grazing committees on production of such reports on crofting activities in their area? Paul um, the, the Commission is, is currently discussing and consulting on how best to ensure that this obligation can be, uh, can be used by all concerned. And uh, I'm aware that the, the, 
feature in the Crofting Assessors Conference in Inverness on the 21st and 22nd of November, which is one vehicle for ensuring people are aware of their requirements. The Commission hopes to develop a user-friendly duty report for, uh, for grazing committees to complete, which will highlight issues uh, that the Commission might consider addressing, and guidance will be provided in due course once this um, process is completed. That now brings us to questions to Justice and Law Officers. And I call question number one, Kenneth Gibson. To ask the Scottish Government what the level of crime in North Ayrshire was in 2007 and what it is now. Cabinet Secretary, Kenny McCaskill. Recorded crime in North Ayrshire has decreased by 5% since 2007. In 2006-07, there were 9,871 crimes recorded in North Ayrshire. In 2011-12, 9,378 crimes were recorded. Uh, this welcome reduction is helping to contribute to the lowest levels of recorded crime in Scotland for 37 years. Kenneth Gibson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. And, uh, I'm just wondering uh, to what extent the Cabinet Secretary believes that the focus on innovative community policing, which has seen an increase in the number of community officers from 30 to 140 in North Ayrshire under the SNP has contributed to the impressive uh, fall in crime which continues to decline. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, absolutely. Police officers across Scotland do a fantastic job. The innovative work in uh, North Ayrshire is simply a part of that. We do believe as a government that a visible police presence uh, correlates with why we have the lowest recorded crime in 37 years. A visible police presence de de reassures good citizens and deters those who would be bad. And that is why we are delighted that we have maintained those 1,000 additional officers that we committed to have delivered and are working in our communities. Supplementary, Margaret McTriggle. Thank you. Given the high incidence of domestic abuse in North Ayrshire and the 7% rise in domestic use, abuse incidents and the third force news reporting two in three women are being turned away from refuges and 30% of domestic abuse charities are finding a funding deficit in 2011-12, what additional resources can the Scottish Government offer these vital services so women who experience domestic abuse get the support they need? Cabinet Secretary. Well, significant and record funding has been put into tackling domestic abuse. And much of that, in terms of dealing with the victims, apart from the support for Victim Support Scotland, comes through other portfolios, but I have no doubt my Cabinet colleagues would be able to comment on that. But I think the Member is right to raise the issue. It is a matter that the Chief Constable of Strathclyde and, indeed, the now uh, Chief Constable of the New Police Service of Scotland has commented on. I think it is quite clear that domestic abuse is part of the culture of violence that we have in Scotland. Uh, it uh, is an issue that we have to address. When it is allied to the abuse of alcohol, significant problems are experienced, although it is not always dependent upon alcohol, but I can give the member the absolute assurance that the current police services, the new single service, will continue to prioritise that, and my colleagues working in other departments will continue to address the needs of those who are the victims, and equally we will continue to work with Victim Support Scotland, Scottish Women Aid, all the other agencies who do a remarkably good job in tackling what is in many instances a cultural problem that needs addressed by each and every one of us, especially those who are male in Scotland. Briefly, Stuart Maxwell. Uh, uh, thank you. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware of much of the comments surrounding the introduction of a single police service. Uh, given that comment, can the Cabinet Secretary tell me whether uh, will, will the move to a single service uh, impact on police numbers in Ayrshire? Cabinet Secretary? No, I don't believe it will. Obviously, the deployment of officers will always be a matter for the Chief Constable. But as I said earlier in response to Kenneth Gibson, we believe that a visible police presence is what has got us to a 37-year low in recorded crime, together with significant progress across <coughs> other areas of crime. The whole purpose of reform is to ensure that we do not go down the route of south of the border, where almost 16,000 officers are to be lost almost as many officers as currently serve in Scotland and will continue to serve. Question number two, Roderick Campbell. To ask the Scottish Government when Sheriff Principal Taylor's report on the review of expenses and funding of civil litigation in Scotland will be published. Minister Rosanna Cunningham. It is hoped that the report of the review of expenses and funding of civil litigation in Scotland will be published prior to the Scottish Parliamentary recess uh, which members uh, will be aware is uh, set to begin on 29th June 2013. Roderick Campbell. I thank the Minister for her answer. Does the Minister agree that the expenses and funding of civil litigation cannot be considered in isolation from the funding and operation of the courts? And accordingly, before final views are formed on the future courts 
Structures Project, can the Minister confirm that the Scottish Government will take account of the findings of Sheriff Principal Taylor? Minister? Uh, well, the, the Government doesn't uh, implement anything in isolation. The Taylor Review, however, is independent and any recommendations will be a matter for Sheriff Principal Taylor. Uh, ensuring that people can exercise their individual and collective rights and helping to resolve disputes fairly and swiftly are important pillars in creating a flourishing economy. The Scottish Government has embarked on a series of national programmes which will deliver the most radical set of reforms to our courts and tribunals in over a century, uh, and they must all be taken together. The Making Justice Work programme will deliver improvements to Scotland's civil and criminal justice system by improving procedures and case management, thus widening access to justice. It will also deliver significant changes to court structures based on proposals put forward by Lord Gill, the Lord President. The findings of Sheriff Principal Taylor's independent review will similarly be integrated into the Making Justice Work programme. Uh, and of course, we cannot reform the structure of our courts without reviewing the court estate and the Scottish Court Service has issued a consultation on which responses are invited from interested parties by 21st December. But that consultation is, of course, also uh, uh, independent of government and it will be for the Lord President to decide on the basis of that consultation which of the proposals he wishes uh, uh, should be to, to be pursued uh, and they will come before uh, the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament. Uh, so I think that uh, uh, all of these things will be uh, looked at together and I would uh, assure the member that that will take place. Question number three, Stuart McMillan. Well, thank you. Can I ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to improve the prison estate in the west of Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. On 29 October 2012, I wrote to the Justice Committee advising that I had agreed the Scottish Prison Service Chief Executive's recommendation that the SPS should proceed to develop HMP Inverclyde as a custom-made national prison for women offenders, with both the regime and the building fully meeting the aspirations and recommendations of the Commission on Women Offenders. To facilitate this change of use for the plan HMP Inverclyde, HMP Greenock will be retained in the medium term as a local prison for male prisoners. Stuart McMillan. <clears throat> I thank the Cabinet Secretary for the reply. Uh, what information uh, can he provide uh, of the estimated economic benefits to Inverclyde of having the new prison built in addition to HMP Greenock remaining open? And also, can the Cabinet Secretary provide an assurance that when contracts are being considered, that Inverclyde-based companies have the opportunity to tender so that Inverclyde can actually gain the maximum economic benefit? Cabinet Secretary? Uh, uh, absolutely, and I think the member raises a fair point. It would be fair to say that in addition to the new prison being built, the economic benefits to Inverclyde are the continuance of HMP HMP Greenock operating, retaining around 180 employees with an annual wage bill of £5.2 million. In addition, Greenock Prison also incurs an expenditure of circa £2.31 million on a range of goods and services and utilities. The construction of a new prison at HM Prison in Verclyde should create substantial economic employment. The new 300-cell prison will cost in the region of £600 million, and a large project of this nature requires many different skills and will create employment opportunities. In terms of the particular point on public service contracts for HMP in Verclyde, there shall be procured in accordance with necessary EU legislation to ensure the facility is fit for purpose and provides value for money. The Scottish Prison Service and the appointed construction contractor will, though, be liaising with Inverclyde Council regarding economic development issues and opportunities it presents for local employment and local businesses to build upon the current significant input and employment and contribution made by the current HM Prison Greenock. Briefly, Sandra White. Thank you very much, President Officer. Uh, in relation to the, the new prison at Timber Clyde, long overdue in the situation in Court and Vale, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what other initiatives are actually ongoing in relation to the recommendations from the Commission set up by Irish Angelini? Cabinet Secretary. A whole variety of matters. Obviously, we cannot remove to HMP Inverclyde immediately, and therefore work is ongoing at HMP Conton Vale to make sure that it is for, for purpose. It does address matters, and there is investment in mental health services and other matters. In addition, the first allocations are being awarded from the Reducing Reoffending Change Fund to support mentoring programmes for women offenders across Scotland, because that was identified by the Dame Ailey Sangelini Commission as one of the clear matters that would help to address reoffending and help to address trying to keep the women on the straight and narrow once they were released. So I can give the member a full commitment that the outstanding work of the Angelini Commission is being delivered and we're seeking, as I say, to work towards trying to deliver the outcomes that they think necessary and we would concur with them. 
Question number four, Christina McKelvey. Thank you very much, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what the average time scale is in which a European arrest warrant is issued in Scotland, which results in an arrest. Cabinet Secretary. Analysis of the six arrests in the last 12 months in respect of European arrest warrants issued in Scotland show that three suspects were arrested within hours or a matter of days. One of these involved an accusation of murder where an arrest was made in five hours. Arrests were made in a further two cases in four months and nine months respectively. The final case involved a period of six years, five months between the European arrest warrant being issued and an arrest being made. Christina McKelvey. Can I thank the campus for that answer? He will be aware that the European arrest warrant has been used very successfully in my own area to return alleged, per alleged perpetrators to face justice for very serious crimes. But is the Cabinet Secretary as worried as I am that not only are the UK putting, government putting this at risk by withdrawing from European arrest warrants, but putting Scotland at risk by withdrawing completely from Europe? Cabinet Secretary. I totally agree, and I disagree with the way with which this has been handled by the Home Secretary. We have registered our objections. The fact of the matter is this decision was made without any intimation to us, and indeed it was made at the time that Strathclyde Peace were actively making it clear they were looking to arrest uh, an individual or individuals in Spain in respect to a very serious crime that had taken place in Scotland. This would not be helpful to promoting the interests of justice here in Scotland. Question number five, Adam Ingram. Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what further measures it will take to prevent the sexual exploitation of children, to support its victims and bring the perpetrators to justice. Cabinet Secretary. Essential work continues to be undertaken to ensure that this abhorrent form of child abuse is prevented and the perpetrators brought to justice. We are refreshing the national guidance on child protection and set up a working group to develop multi-agency local protocols for a number of child protection issues, including child sexual exploitation for all parts of Scotland. And following on from a recent visit by myself to the Child Exploitation and Online Protection Centre in London and the recently published report on exploring the scale and nature of child sexual exploitation in Scotland, commissioned by the Scottish Government, officials will soon be meeting with key stakeholders to discuss what further action needs to be taken. Adam Ingram. I thank the Minister for the response. Uh, the research he, he mentioned indicated that there is a lack of robust evidence regarding the numbers of children and young people who experience sexual exploitation in Scotland. And of course, we've all been scandalised by the disgraceful Savile affair and the failure by the BBC and others to reveal systematic child sexual abuse. How will the government ensure that all incidences of sexual exploitation are properly record recorded and data collected so that we can build a more accurate picture of the nature and scale of the problem in Scotland for the future. Cabinet Secretary. It makes a, a fair and valid point. As the report I mentioned highlights, it is difficult to estimate the prevalence of child sexual exploitation in Scotland, just as it has been in the rest of the UK. The problem is not visible, and investigation is hindered by the differences in how the issue is defined. Uh, but an act action does need to be taken. As reviewed in the National Child Protection Guidance, the collection of national child protection statistics will change from next year. This will lead to more robust statistics, including more detailed information on child exploitation and sexual abuse. Also, the Scottish Government will be exploring options to improve local data collection in Scotland around child sexual exploitation by potentially working further with the University of Bedfordshire on piloting a data monitoring tool with a local authority in Scotland. So we are going to take the action that we think is appropriate here, work with partner agencies in law enforcement and in government south of the border, work with stakeholders here to work for the protection of children, and equally I think it would be fair to say that it is also the responsibility of each and every one of us to make sure that the children who are vulnerable in our community are protected. Law enforcement will do its bit, and equally we must work together for the protection of the most vulnerable. Briefly, Alec Ferguson. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, with the, with the best will in the world, and I mean that, how anyone can truly support the long-term victims of child abuse and bring the perpetrators to justice when there continues to be a time bar in place for prosecution? Cabinet Secretary. 
Well, uh, these matters are always sort of rebuttals and matters that can be addressed. Clearly, there's a difference here in how we deal with civil matters and how we deal with criminal matters. And indeed, we are giving consideration in terms of how we address matters. I think I can give an assurance that the, those representing law enforcement do their utmost. And indeed, it would be fair to say that as Cabinet Secretary for Justice, I'm aware of the number of people now spending time in prison for historic offences. It is rightly so. They may have been perpetrated many years ago, but these people took the innocence and childhood away from many innocent, vulnerable people, and they will be punished. In respect of other matters, it is appropriate that we seek to provide assurances, and those matters have been worked at by myself and indeed and governmental colleagues to make sure we address the ongoing problems that individuals face who have suffered trauma. But I'm happy to discuss matters with the uh, member, given his interest uh, outside the chamber, to give him confirmation as to what work is ongoing. Question number six, Mark Griffin. To ask the Scottish Government on what date the exceptional circumstances arose that the Lord Advocate refers to in his letter to Ruth Davidson of 30th of October 2012 relating to legal advice on an independent Scotland's membership of the European Union. Lord Advocate Frank Mulholland. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As the Deputy First Minister said in a statement on the 23rd of October following the Ed Edinburgh Agreement, on the 15th of October, ministers considered the conditions existed to seek specific legal advice from the law officers in EU membership. That request was formally made to me on the 23rd of October, along with a request to disclose that fact. I gave my consent to the release of that information on the 23rd of October, when the Deputy First Minister made her announcement to the Parliament. Mark Griffin. Thank the Lord Advocate for that answer. Um, but I would ask him, what was the legal barrier? to allowing the Scottish Government to reveal to Parliament that no legal advice had been sought on continued EU membership, given that the agreement he mentions has no legal basis and no legislation has been passed in either Parliament. In legal terms, how did the signing of the agreement create the exceptional circumstances outlined in the letter to Ruth Davidson? And would the Lord Advocate not agree with me that the three points stated in his letter to Ruth Davidson were valid on the 4th of March this year, and that if asked, on that basis, he would have been able to give the Scottish Government permission to disclose that no legal advice had been sought on continued membership of the EU had it been requested. Lord Advocate. Uh, let me deal with, firstly, uh, whether the exceptional circumstances existed prior to consent being given on the 23rd of October. Firstly, it is for ministers to judge the appropriate point to seek specific legal advice from the law officers. As a general principle, paragraph 231 of the Ministerial Code provides that law officers should be consulted in good time before the Government is committed to significant decisions involving legal consideration. The Deputy First Minister has explained to Parliament that the Edinburgh Agreement in laying out an agreed route to independence provided the basis upon which specific legal advice could be sought. Now, further up until that point, it was possible that the referendum could be the subject of court proceedings with all the uncertainty that that entails. It was possible that the Court would rule that this Parliament did not have the power to hold a referendum, in which case the issue would be academic. Following the signing of the Edinburgh Agreement, there will be a lawful referendum, so that uncertainty has been removed. And you may also want to, uh, you may also want Order, to, uh, to look at uh, a letter uh, from the Attorney-General of the UK Government uh, dated the 21st of, 22nd of January two, uh, 2011 to the shadow leader of the House of Lords. The Attorney General referred to the fact that it should be for government to determine how to use the law officer resource which legal advisers to engage in a given situation and what stage to employ them. Uh, further, in relation to uh, a very important convention, the Law Officers Convention, that allows legal advice to be given uh, in private, to be given candidly because it is private. Uh, and that allows government the space in which to develop policy uh, without that legal advice being made public. That is a very important convention. It is an, a, a convention which is recognised by the UK government. In fact, the UK government successfully de defended that convention recently in 2009. It is a convention that applies in Scotland. It is a convention which is applied since 1865, and it is a convention which is uh, enshrined in the Ministerial Code. Question number seven, Hans Alan Malik. To ask this, uh, good afternoon. To ask the Scottish Government what the Lord Advocate's priorities are 
for the Crown Office and Authority Fiscal Services for the next two years. Solicitor General Leslie Thompson. Both the Lord Advocate and I are clear that the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service plays a pivotal part in the delivery of justice in Scotland, and we support the aims in the Scottish Government's strategy for justice in Scotland. We have stated that our main priority for COPFS in relation to the prosecution and to the investigation of deaths is to achieve operational effectiveness to ensure appropriate and proportionate action is taken in all cases. However, we recognise that we must give priority to the most serious crimes due to their nature and the impact they have on victims and communities. Therefore, the priorities for COPFS over the next two years in relation to casework include domestic abuse, hate crime, knife crime, serious and organised crime, proceeds of crime, unresolved homicides, sexual crime and violent crime. As well as setting these priorities, we recognise the benefit of specialism and will continue that beyond those that are already established in health and safety crime, serious and organised crime, wildlife crime and sexual crime. The public interest is at the heart of the decisions we make to take into account the needs of victims, witnesses and the communities we serve. Hans Malik. Thank you for a very detailed response. Given that the Lord Advocate is likely to be asked advice on a range of issues relating to independence, how will that balance be achieved and how the priorities will be met? For example, how do the comments to Ruth Davidson on the 30th of October that the government documents which state that the independent Scotland would continue to be a member of the EU were underpinned by legal advice? tallies with Nicola Sturgeon's comments on the 23rd October that the Scottish Government had not sought special, specific legal advice. Solicitor General. Perhaps it would be helpful if I make it clear that the role of the law officers as legal advisors to the Scottish Government is entirely separate of the role of the law officers and the independence of the Criminal Prosecution Service. And in my first answer, I was indicating the priorities for the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service over the next two years. That ends questions, and we have to.